So I'd, I'd like to propose that we move to the, because our trust speakers have put us a bit behind time, which is good, we've had a good discussion, but that we move on to the kind of the main discussion now and that we can address the specific points that, that, that maybe Paul's raised in the context of that wider discussion. Um, I think it might make sense to, uh, as we address kind of what works and what's missing, um, to maybe divide it into the population variation and then the, 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 the patient variation that's associated with phenotype. Uh, and maybe if we start with population variation. Uh, and I think it would be good to get a sense of people's satisfaction with what's available in terms of population variation, uh, both in terms of, uh, of, of single nucleotide variants, but also actually all forms of genetic variation. Is it in the form, that, is it as, as dense as people would like? Is it in the form that people would like? Has it come associated with the annotations that people would like? Uh, you know, and I'm sure Steve will be very interested in what's the single thing that you would like to see that isn't there. I just want to add an uh, informatics comment that the NHLBI exome variant server that's hosted out of University of Washington on the Seattle Seeks web page has 5,200 exomes available for people to look at to look for their variants. Nas. Hi, I'm Nas Rahman from the Institute of Cancer Research. Um, yes, yeah, sort of going on from that and this question of the things that uh, we often think is known and robust but actually isn't. One of the things that uh, I think often doesn't get talked about, but I, I think is very important, is that aspect of actually the annotation of what the actual variation is. So we increasingly talk about that it's going to be easy to detect these vari variants, and but what do we do about them? But actually the calling of those variants, the annotation of that variance is a really, really big problem. So I'm sure anyone who's been doing exomes will see deciding which transcript to use, um, deciding how you're going to call it. Um, and then if you're historically going to try and get things out of the databases, there's been quite a lot of changes in how we've uh, defined those um, clinically, how we've, um, uh, which reference we've used, so that if you look historically for a number of genes, you'll see the same mutation called different things. Um, and that's obviously going to uh, impede our, our ability to maximize the use of that information. I think there's been quite a lot of movement to, to try and standardize that, um, and often that's with relevance uh, relation to the genomic reference. Um, and I can see that that's, um, uh, that's probably the way it has to go, but what it does mean is that you end up with very, very long strings like RS numbers that are impossible to sort of keep in your mind in a clinical, in a clinical way. So a mutation that you may sort of feel quite comfortable about, now it's sort of some seven-digit number and you, you can't, can't remember it. But I think this is a real, really important problem that if we can try and standardize how we're actually going to annotate uh, variations that we're going to need if we're going to clinically interpret them. Steve? Just to follow up that point, is the HGVS nomenclature a comfortable system as an alternative to RS numbers? I mean, it does give you some transcript context. Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, I think, well, in some ways, I mean, clinically, I think most of us use that. That has changed. Uh, a lot of things in that has changed over the years. Um, and I think there are a number of ways in which that doesn't naturally integrate very well with a genomic-based system. Um, and um, I think there needs to be a coming together that will allow, um, and they're not, it's not automatable in, in, in a way sometimes I think that one would want for a, a simplified sort of system on genomics. I'm sure a lot of people have different um, views about it, but it's, it's a problem. Uh, and deciding what the transcript, you know, deciding what, G, what the gene is, is. So to, to what degree does the LRG initiative that Paul mentioned address some of the concerns that you have about that? I'm not sure. <laughs> Paul, do you want to just, I mean, because I, I see, sense some overlap there. The, the goal of the initiative is to create a stable reference sequence, <coughs> so something that is not, uh, not changing, not versioned, is not a, um, an ensemble transcript, a RefSeq transcript, uh, something that over time may have been reported in a way that in fact doesn't map to today's reporting and, and gives the ability to report from one version of the human genome assembly uh, to another as that changes and collect information that exists in the genome coordinates and put it back into a smaller set of locus coordinates. Um, as I said, this is an informatics solution. It largely does solve these informatics problems, but there are, I think, still challenges to adoption. 
So I've actually got two points to make now. One is in direct response to this, that, that while I think it would be great to have a single reference sequence, define it and be done, uh, I'll report uh, on a conference that NHLBI hosted a couple months ago where we discussed the same issue. And the general consensus of that group was that while it would be ideal to have a single never changing reference, the realistic solution or, or thought process is with evolving technology, with ever increasing knowledge, that may be utopian, uh, and it may require that references be date and time stamped, methods of sequence generation be annotated, so that as things inevitably evolve, it's possible to go back and look at, at what it was compared to. So, so a reference standard is critical, but it probably is, in the real world, gonna have to evolve. The other point that I would make, which kind of follows on that and the previous part of the discussion, is that thinking as a clinician, I don't really care if it's an RS number, or if it's C677T, or if it's the words thermal labile MTHFR. What I need to know is how do I translate from one language to another? So one of the databases that I think is missing is something that very easily lets me move from one to the next, so that no matter what a patient comes to me with, or someone else comes to me with, I can say, oh, what, that foreign language that you're using translates to this language that I'm familiar with, and then I can go out and figure out what to do with it. Yeah, and I think that that's where the, uh, you know, the, it's, I'm so glad to hear that you're working on standardized vocabulary and structured language and this sort of thing. And, and obviously with you and with uh, NHLBI both working on this, um, that goes a long way to create the functionality at the user side to be able to navigate more seamlessly. Because in my vision, you know, the report comes into the electronic health record there's an interpretation with a link that, you know, again, the clinician doesn't need to understand the language but can click on that link to get to where they need to go to understand how to use it. So my question is, um, uh, obviously, you're two big players that are developing the standardized uh, vocabulary and structured representation. Are there major players that contribute uh, to these types of databases who aren't a part of that effort to uh, develop a structured vocabulary? And if so, um, what, what do you think we would need to do to bring them in so that we can all be working off the same page? So I think in general, um, and it, it's, I think it shows both the importance of the, of the problem, but there's also an unfortunate nature to it, that there are, for, every, for almost every big player, there's an effort to create some standardized something. Um, it's actually shouldn't probably be a surprise, but uh, we, we certainly have worked closely with a number of different groups and we continue to do so. Uh, the, the collaboration between EBI and NCBI I think adds weight and a center of gravity to things that makes it more difficult to ignore. But uh, for us to be effective, we do have to, we, we can't sit in a room together a whole bunch of informaticians and come up with the answer because the answer won't be useful. Well, it won't be, it might be useful. But it, <laughs> but it, it, it will be more useful if, if we are sort of properly integrated in the right communities to do this. I, I, think, I, I think I can speak for Donna. She may want to speak for herself. But, that uh, um, we have made a number of efforts to, to contact these groups and we are working closely with them. So, and be they, be they uh, groups such as locus specific databases, people who uh, work with diagnostic and, and run diagnostic labs, people who are also trying to aggregate information uh, for use in, in clinical uh, interpretation. So, so as co-chair, I'm gonna from time to time just kind of pull out something that I at least think might be an important action item to take forward. And it seems to me that this would be something where uh, we would need to explore the role that perhaps NHGRI could play <coughs> as a convener uh, to bring the different people around the table because we definitely don't want to be in a VHS Betamax situation and let the market decide. I think that you're absolutely right. We need to get the right people around the table uh, so that we can do it and make sure that we don't have um, um, a sort of a, a balkanization of this whole process. So, so before we kind of move away from the, uh, the discussion of population variation uh, and get into the possibly thornier issues of, of the clinical information, 
Um, so now it's people's opportunity to, you know, to give their wish list to, to Steve and Paul. So are there, are, there, are there any burning desires of what people want to see from population variation resources? Bruce Blumberg, Kaiser Permanente. I want to follow up on a point that Mark made earlier, that is that we're not all from Wisconsin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we need a database that will be just as relevant for underserved populations as for the people who've had their genome studied so far. And stating the obvious, when I look around the room, the people in this room aren't very representative of the population of the United States either. So we, we really need to be careful to provide a database that's relevant to all populations, not just uh, white upper middle class populations. So I guess one point I'd like to make uh, relating to that is, is uh, we saw Les show that a frequency of one and a half percent, I think, was the cutoff used. Now it's, it's one thing to study a population and be confident <coughs> that you've discovered all the one and a half percent variants. It's another thing to be confident that you've got the frequency right. So that when you say it's a one and a half percent variant, it is actually a one and a half percent variant. And I think that's something that needs consideration is actually the depth to which we go within each population to be able to make those statements coherently. Tim. Just on this reference populations, people have been talking about the reference genome. The reference genome actually now isn't just a single version because you capturing variants is one thing, but there are regions where there are completely alternate alleles in the population and the reference genome is beginning to capture that, so in the form of patches right now. So ultimately, maybe it has to become a whole graph structure, and that's what you should be doing your analysis on. Um, but there's, there's the variants, the individual point variants, but there's also this internal structure of the reference, which people should be aware of. Steve, last word on the population variation. Um, well, there's another dimension to this that D.B. Snip has uh, struggled with. There's a tension between uh, trying to be ecumenical for all variation and then realizing that, that some people are interested strictly in germline variation and others are interested in somatic variation, both of which could be benign and just neutral polymorphism. It comes up in sequencing. Um, and right now we're, we're trying to put all of it in DB step but clearly partition it and so that you can get through the downloads, the things that are germline, the things that are somatic coming in. And I'm just wondering from a group like this, is that you know, the, the right approach, are there, you know, other category, I mean, we're going to face this again with epigenetics and, and marks coming <coughs> in. And so is there thinking about how we want the repositories to accumulate these data, separate resources, one place to go, but clearly identified, you know, just some feedback on that would be helpful for planning. Um, one question or point on population databases. One of the challenges we have is we look toward databases like uh, dbSNP for what the control population is. But in fact, a lot of the populations from which that data came are disease populations. And when you dive into that data, it's very, very difficult to figure out where it came from, whether it was part of a disease cohort or whether it was part of a, a true control ho cohort, which in and of itself is challenging because sometimes these are younger individuals when you're trying to study a late onset disease, and that's very challenging. So, you know, ways to have little better description of what those populations are from which this large scale data sets are being submitted would be extremely useful. And another minor point, you know, in using dbSNP in particular, RS numbers are not variants, they're locations. And so we have numerous examples of both a pathogenic and a benign variant mapping to the same RS number because it's a location with both a C to an A being pathogenic and a C to a T being benign and makes it very, very difficult to decipher what's in there. So on the population level, those are some, some of my wish list. So if you move on to the... Along those lines, it's, it's pretty easy for me if I have an RS number to go into dbSNP and find the information I want, and, and they can confirm, you know, in, in the um, HGVS nomenclature with it. But my analysis programs don't work that way. They give me the HGVS nomenclature, and I can get to the RS number, but it takes me about three or four clicks to get there, as opposed to I need it in one click. So. Even though, yes, I need a translation between the two, as, as Howard was saying, I would really like just to work out of one nomenclature. 
Right, and so if we, if we move on now to the, 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 to the more clinical variation attached to phenotype. So I want, I want to just raise one kind of very high level uh, point just to, just to gauge people's views on it. If we've been talking about clinically actionable variants rather than clinically actionable collections of variants or clinically actionable genomes, we've been talking about a very variant by variant approach. Does it concern people that we're not taking a genome perspective, we're taking a variant perspective? Howard? So, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> What I would love to see, of course, we need the research to tie together one sequence variant with 10, 50, 100 other sequence variants. But at the next scale up, we need to tie that into epigenomic variation, microbiome variation, the next cool thing that's going to go, oh, I forgot, copy number variation, whatever the next cool genomic or proteomic thing will be. But that's still not enough. We have to tie that to environmental variation. Let's not call it the environment, please. Uh, but as far as database construction, assuming for the moment that we can snap our fingers and all that data exists, what I would love to see is smart informatics people build these discrete databases in such a way that they all speak to each other seamlessly behind the scenes that I don't have to look at, and I can build my own search clinically or my own resource clinically that says, show me the sequence variants and the microbiome variants among smokers, and just let me put it all together and tell me what I want to know and cross-reference all of it so that if I want to drill down and get all the way back to the primary literature so I can go back, like Heidi said, and determine, okay, was that a reliable study that it was based on before I came up six levels to the clinically actionable information? I can do it if I want. And if I just want to get the answer and go, I can do that too. So maybe by, you know, next week. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah. I saw lots of nodding heads when I mentioned the question. Oh, no. Howard McLeod from University of North Carolina. I, I, I would strongly encourage us to not build one database. Uh, I think that we're trying to build uh, something that fit is uh, purpose uh, built for a bunch of different purposes. And I think that was called the UGO. Um, uh, and it didn't work very well. But uh, you know, even the Hummer is no longer uh, in production. So we, we, we can have multiple databases. They just have to interact with each other. You know, there are multiple ways of translating from, from Italian to English. And none of it makes sense, but it's, you know, it's still, the, there are those, those ways. So I, I think we need to get away from, you know, one, we're, we're talking about variability and we're trying to build one size fits all. Uh, and, and it's okay to have something that's geared towards clinical apl application and something that's geared towards genomic science, and as long as we are thoughtful in how we build it. You know, Capisco, but um, uh, uh, to yeah, be, to build on that, um, I think that's a really important point for the for the meeting as a whole. Is that um, the purpose, as I see it, is not to try and create the uh, database because that will be doomed uh, to failure, um, particularly since we don't know where ninety percent of the heritability currently lies. Yeah, with something like that, um, we're in the same boat as the physicist who somehow misplaced ninety-five percent of the universe. So. Um, but I think the, uh, the issues that are salient are uh, what I would like to see come away from the meeting are an identification of we know what we currently have in terms of resources, where are the big hairy gaps that we don't have? And of those big hairy gaps, which are the ones that um, would be most appropriate, say, for NHGRI to take some ownership on to say we need to fill that gap? And which are the ones where we'd say, this is a, an important gap, but this probably would fall better to this group to be able to do it, with the underlying assumption that um, uh, there will be uh, the ability to aggregate that. And I think that's something that Ken is going to be talking about a fair amount in his talk about how um, that type of a multiple database integration uh, system will work. I also, I also think it's important to think about how this is ultimately likely to be used. I mean, if this is going to be used in, as I suspect it will be, uh, electronic health records, which are increasingly more and more commercial products, it's going to have to be done in a way that there is a place that these commercial EHR vendors can point their software at and on a regular basis get feeds. Uh, so it's not going to be a clinician going and looking in a database. It's going to be a clinician looking in an electronic health record 
where the electronic health record system has taken that data in and through some magical process that we all still need to think about, has presented them with the information they need to see. So um, it, it's really a big step to go from uh, you know, being able to look in Ensemble and actually get a regular data feed into an electronic health record system that a vendor is going to use. Uh, Rex, I agree with you, but I, I think I also hear around the room that we still need, or it, there, there's a, a, a reason to develop some sort of common resource that has sort of the, the common clinically actionable variants to date that could be useful for the clinician that doesn't have access to the EHR. Uh, and because they yeah. have to build that anyway, yeah. the underpinnings yeah. for any yeah. of these pipelines. Yeah. Actually, on some, of, you know, um, Paul mentioned this, this predictor thing, which you know, it already is a service that is layered on top of. Is there a question at the back? Uh, Andrew Johnson, NHLBI. Um, in terms of thinking about areas not currently covered, I think it was alluded to in one talk that uh, phasing is, is something that may be not well captured and could be important, at least for some genes. So I'd be interested to hear from uh, Paul or Steve or others in terms of thinking in a forward perspective, genome sequences may allow us to, uh, to, to phase variants over long distances, but then that's going to be uh, harder to store in the databases and re require a different framework. So I could just quick reply, I mean, what we're doing now is looking at uh, genotypes as a high throughput deliverable. I mean, it's, it's orders of magnitude larger than SNPs because it's the product of every one type times the whole genome. Uh, but coming in with these data are uh, phase information. And so there, we are looking towards storing it as haplotypes, you know, as it in doing data reduction on that dimension where it's uh, delivered. We've got 1,000 genomes is probably the leading <laughs> project doing this. And, it's a little easier than in a clinical context. We're looking with deep population samples. So I don't think the methods are there yet, but trying to get the infrastructure worked out and how we would exchange that information is the necessary next step. And then I think we can piggyback clinical uh, uh, linkage interpretation on whatever we've worked out for the big population projects. Sorry, the lady there. Thanks. Um, Bill, can I, ask, I, I like the way this, this conversation is going because I think it, it is going to be a network of networks. We have to understand that we're going to be using modern network technology just like the finance industry does, just like the entertainment industry does. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, Mark. I can put all my financial records into mint.com and I can get some pretty sophisticated analysis out of them. And just two other uh, relationships to that. One, let's please not make be dependent on EMRs. EMRs are undergoing massive consolidation. I'm not sure that the ones that exist now will exist 10 years from now. They are not nimble. They are not flexible. They are not going to be able to do this. What they will be is one source of information that we will have, primary source of information that we can combine with other sources. And I don't think it's too early to put one other resource on the table that hasn't been put on, and that's the citizen of the United States. Citizens of the United States is increasingly going to own, control, and distribute their information, and they're going to do that with genomes. Genome-wide scanning is going to be on people's Facebook pages. We have to exploit the fact that people have time, opportunity to be able to do this. Sites like Ancestry.com have 26 million family histories that people have invested time to collect and annotate from various sources. There is enormous potential out there. They are a resource. <coughs> Do you have a proposal how that potential can be captured? Sure. Um, you take the capabilities of an Ancestry.com and you begin to transition it to, um, you know, med medical histories as opposed to genealogical histories. They're interested in ancestry DNA and ethnicity DNA, which is going to be important. Um, but who knows more about their epigenic, their environmental exposures than the individual does? Um, and that individual can, you know, annotate their individual thing. And most people are altruistic. <laughs> They would like that information to be used in an aggregate source to advance research. So there is an agent out there that can help us build, um, you know, one component of this network of networks that is, has the time and interest, and it's most important for them to be able to do it. So I think we, we have to look outside our traditional scientific um, spectrum to say, 
not just to criticize these people who are saying, well, they're offering DNA tests direct to the public, but saying, okay, who of those are, are people that we might be able to work with in the future to be able to take this thing forward in a, in a better and faster fashion? Uh, I wanted to make um, two comments, uh, really, and some aspect of practicality too. So I was really struck by the contrast. Uh, you know, Howard got up and said, you know, a clinician wants it hard, fast, and now. And then Paul gave a talk, and I sort of thought, oh gosh, I can see why his wife screams at him. Uh, <laughs> 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 Because Paul, you, at, at one stage, no, no, I mean, I'm joking, but I'm being tongue in cheek, but you actually said, you know, using the command line, uh, you can customize this in a really simple way. Okay? And that was a real contrast, because it was exactly not what the clinician was asking for. So, what I wanted to ask you is who do you, I know who your audience has been or who your client base has been up until now, but what I just really wanted to ask in a really practical way is, is EBI beginning to rethink what its client base would be, and would some of those clients start to be more clinicians and genetics clinical labs as distinct from very much in the research side, and if so, what initiatives are happening around that? And then before you answer, just to make the other point, which I think picks up on your point, I think we need to remember today that causation and prediction are two completely different things. They have some overlaps, but they are not entirely overlapping. And so one of the challenges will be that whilst, yeah, we can look at variant by variant and think about causation, actually what's more challenging to think about is that it's not just, in Rex alluded to, you know, what if it, you do a score from 33 variants or whatever, but actually your entire GWAS printout could be a predictive tool itself at that level. And that poses a, a whole other set of challenges about how you might present, uh, how you might collate and present that information. Do you see what I yeah. mean? Paul, okay. oh, do you want to? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I, I, you're right to one. Uh, the, the top bullet on the, uh, the final slide that I had, we, we are not, and we do not want to be, and we are not marketing ourselves to be a clinical uh, support, decision support tool. I believe that we should provoke, we should be in the next level down. Okay. So the people who want to build those interfaces for the clinicians mm -hmm. should find in us basically that what was just okay. described, that the place sense. that you, they can point their resources at to get updated information on a regular basis. Now, I think at the EBI, we, so I'll, I'll put it very strongly. If after 20 years of collecting the world's biomolecular data, this data turns out to be useless, for understanding human health, we will have really screwed up. Um, and so, so we are interested in making our resources absolutely as useful for interpretation and, and healthcare uh, approaches. But you know, to be honest, I think there's probably two MDs out of 500 people at the EBI, and neither one of them are practicing. And so, our role is is deeper in the infrastructure generally. Okay. Um, we want to make better connections so that we can provide that when people ask for things, we're giving them the types of answers that they want. Uh, it, you know, it, it was kind of the point made about the genome as a graph. I don't even want to consider the genome as a graph, and I'm certain the clinicians don't, but somebody has to to make this work, and that's got to be deeply buried in the system. That's very helpful. Thank you. Question for the back there. Yeah, a comment. Uh, Gail Herman, I'm a clinical geneticist, Nationwide Children's Hospital. And I think um, f this is going to only work as good as the clinical phenotyping that goes into it. If we want to look at clinical utility, and so how to address to get as much clinical information that's accurate, that's updatable. If you start with kids, they're going to get older and they're going to have new problems, and you want to incorporate that. And I really like the idea over there of having people put in their own information. Um, it may not all be accurate, but it's probably going to be as accurate as a lot of the information you'll get from other sources. I think um, clinicians are going to need to educate people maybe about how to put information, clinical information, into these databases. Um, but I think the clinical labs know that when you have a detailed form 
maybe one in 10 times you get the information you ask for, so you can't go back from the lab data to the clinical phenotyping that you'd like very often. So that raises a big question about phenotyping, which might be something that we want to touch on. We just want to have, uh, in the last kind of couple of minutes, voices that we've not heard from, um, and then... Thank you very much. My name is John Parkinson. I'm from the UK, and I have the privilege of running <clears throat> the current 5 million EHR database, and soon will be a 52 million EHR database. And I just request from a, a comment made a while ago that we don't generalize about EMRs, or I call them EHRs, and throw them all away. There are some very good ones out there, and I think we need to respect that. I think we disagree. <laughs> um, we yeah. could disagree, perhaps we should talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any last final comments that people want to talk? A few, maybe very briefly, one or two sentences. Okay, so basically I got nervous when a, something I said in my talk about phase, that I need to know if this mutation and this mutation in the same gene are on different chromosomes, to then a discussion about haplotype blocks. And I think that's my concern about what I'm trying to do in the clinical to what you know, people are trying to do at a genome level. The haplotype of blocks, unless these two, two variants on the same chromosome a long ways away actually contribute to the phenotype, I don't really care about it. So I, I just, it, it's like it jumped from here to here, and I'm in the clinical lab. I need to be, you know, I'm, I need to know more than, I mean, I need to be able to dig down more than what Howard was saying, that his clinicians want a, you know, two-minute thing. I'm the one having to go in and, and do that, but I can't go from here to, to, to there and sift through all of that d data. So I need to be able to do it, not in two minutes, but within 30 minutes, you know and get it. So it, it really made me a little nervous to see how a simple little phrase <laughs> jumped and all of a sudden got I'll to a point that I couldn't do. coffee between yeah. you two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other comments? Rick? I think a few people are going to need to turn off their microphones. There we go. Um, I just wanted to, uh, not taking the sides on the EMR discussion, I think uh, the broader perspective is, is that uh, we have to be open to the idea of non-traditional ways to access uh, data, and I agree with Bill in the sense that uh, we've had some discussions with Ancestry.com about incorporating family history data along with the family structure. I think that as we look at uh, some of the information about where is the missing heritability, it seems like at least some of it may be an ultra-rare. Uh, um, SNPs that are probably fam family specific, so understanding family structures at a, at a, uh, a genealogic level uh, is probably going to be important, and so uh, thinking about that type of information. The phenotyping information is critically important, and I think patients can probably supply some of that, but that is a role, I think, where electronic data warehouses that are generated through EMRs, if we can figure out a way to get the data out, can also enhance, if for no other reason than to do validation. Uh, of uh, patient-entered data, um, but I think that we can't, I, I would agree with Bill in the sense that we can't lock ourselves into thinking that the way we've always done medicine is going to be sustainable in the future. Uh, it's going to have to be more distributed, and so we need to be able to create an innovation space uh, that allows us to test out different ways to do it and see what works and what doesn't. Great. I think we're going to have to leave it there because uh, some of us are, are fueled by caffeine. Uh, and we don't have very long to consume it now. So, <laughs> so, uh, so thank you very much for the discussion, and we'll return at uh, five minutes past eleven, I believe.